Well, Simon Diggins is my favourite defence analyst and he is here, uh, as is Paul Connolly, who is a former Mirror Group editor and author. Both sides of the debate here. Big policy on a lot of the front pages of the Sunday papers today. Labour uh, have rubbished the plan, but the Conservatives say that they want to, all 18-year-olds to be offered, uh, they're saying it's compulsory, but they can opt out of it. Doesn't sound that compulsory. They can do some form of national service. Now, that is either military service or they can go into the NHS, they can go into policing, fire service and help out in some way whether it's a full-time thing for a year or whether it is once a month for every weekend uh, a weekend a month I mean Simon Diggins and Paul Connolly thank you very much indeed for joining me this morning Simon I wonder what you think the case for this is uh, what your reasoning for thinking that it is a good idea are you're very welcome to the program thank you much thank you for your, uh, your kind thoughts as well um, I think the, the justification for it is always multi multi-purpose it could well be issues around, for example, defence resilience, more national resilience, things we haven't got enough people around to do it. But I think the important thing about it, and I think the one that's been emphasised so far in the debate, is a sense of kind of bringing people together, a sense of national identity, national esprit de corps, if you like, national ethos, which as people then move from, from childhood through youth into adult life properly, uh, they'll, they'll bring with them. And I think that's that latter element, which I think is a very positive thing, which is the strongest part about the suggestions and the plan so far. There's a lot of detail that I think is unclear. And the real danger is that we'll all get bogged down in the detail about whether or not the particular form of service is the right one or the wrong one. But, but there are but practical the questions, behind... Simon, that, with yeah. respect, there are practical questions. I mean, you're saying about yeah. being bogged down in the detail. But even if you say, I, I mentioned this earlier, when you have you know one weekend a month for the people who don't do the military side of things, which is obviously your area of expertise, but if they're doing some other form of service, well, if you have a part-time job, for example, or even if you have a full-time job, are you going to work five days a week and then do this in addition to it? There are lots of practical concerns to be to be worked right. out and that that's fair enough isn't it yeah, no that, that's an absolutely fair point I and mean, maybe you look at the you look at our territorials for example at the moment that's exactly what a lot of them do they'll work five days a week normally and then they'll actually work do a weekend weekend for that but, but they're choosing course, to do think, so simon it, indeed they are but i think actually you know the, the issue around around the the obligation for do something for your country like this is actually that's part of what the the expectation that you you are going to do that there is also you might call it smart recruiting smart a smart way of doing this uh, and that's something we, we started to do with our reservists over the last 15 20 years so rather than just being saying you will turn on a particular day if somebody's got a particular obligation you can defer that obligation to later so you are right there are practical details around it but i think we should be a little bit wary okay. of just allowing if you like the the genuine and they are genuine issues about how that the details worked out to get in the way of what should be a much bigger conversation about how do we use national service the opportunity to do national service to bring people together and do something a that's possibly useful for the country itself whether it be military resilience civilian resilience and i listened to one of your earlier earlier talks around and the lady talked about overseas and overseas assistance why not you know make let's okay. make it as broad okay. as that and, and do that that's, that's how i see it paul connor who's a former mirror group editor and author paul uh, i uh, understand you're not quite as enthusiastic as simon is what do you think of this what one could say that yes i mean two words spring to mind here gimmick and general election um or three words uh, this is this is aimed this is this is aimed at trying to woo reform voters you know by a government by a tory government that is actually or a tory party that's absolutely struggling and destined to lose heavily at the general election and they know it i mean it, it is absurd and funnily enough Richard Tice, it's not just Labour and the Lib Dems, Richard Tice, the leader of reform this morning, called, called it desperate, ill-considered and impractical. I, I don't normally agree with Richard Tice, but on this occasion, he's right. I mean, it, it, it is it is a pure, a pure gimmick. And I, I remember that Sir Patrick Sanders, the army chief, back in January, floated an idea about the return of national service. And guess what? Number 10 called it unhelpful, slapped him down and said there would never be any sort of compulsory military service. So this, this really is a government all at sea. And this, and this morning during the TV studio rounds, the Home Secretary, James Peverly, was like a man who was making it up as he went along at what he be about. I mean, well, well, there is, there is a lot of there is a lot of. They scramble this together on the back of one of Richie Sunak's uh, planned. Uh, I think I think I, repeated. 
I think a number of people feel that way. I think a number of people feel that way, Paul, in terms of the level of detail that's still to be worked out. And and, and Simon was saying, you know, even uh, people who are for this are still asking for details. You mentioned Reform UK there. I just want to play a clip of Nigel Farage, who is, of course, a senior member of Reform UK in terms of his thoughts on this. He spoke to Sky News this morning. (laughs) <laughs> they don't support it either. It's a joke, isn't it? I mean, look, what you do, you get a focus group of half a dozen reform voters in a room, and the chairman says, now, um, what about national service? Oh, I think it's a very good idea. The rest say, yeah, actually, not a bad idea. Oh, policy. So, you know, I mean, look, you know, when you're a weak leader, and Sunak is not a leader in any way at all, you're a follower. So you follow what the focus groups say, and you say, by doing this, I can attack the uh, reform vote. Simon, I want to come back to you in a second, but I just want to read you two messages that we've received. Mick in Wallington has texted to say, National Service, brilliant. It will break up county lines, street gangs, grooming gangs and feckless lost generation. Only the woke will object as it will outmanoeuvre them. Mary in County Down has been in touch to say that National Service is not a bad concept, but it has to be incentivised. Employers should ask major, uh, government, I'm sorry, should ask major employers to use it as an essential or desirable criteria for job applications and universities should give credits for applicants who've completed national service, counted as another A-level, for example. If young people knew it would definitely advance their careers, they would be more enthusiastic about it. Lots of pupils do Duke of Edinburgh or other voluntary schemes to enhance their university and job applications. I wonder what you make of those thoughts, Simon. No, I mean, firstly, if I just, just to, 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 to rip out some really short pull, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to talk about the politics thing. I mean, it, it, it is come out at a particular time in the election cycle, uh, and so that you could, it, it's, it's a legitimate question, question that. I will say, however, it's been around as, as, a, as an idea, a positive idea, to a politician like Rory Stewart for a number, number of years. And you did hear General Sir Patrick Sons talking about the options conscription before. Tobias Elwood, certainly another military man. Uh, We talked to him earlier on today. He says it's sort of his idea and he's been working it up, although he he concentrated a lot more for obvious reasons, and I'm not criticising him for doing so, on the sort of military element of it. But Paul, I wonder, uh, I mean, in terms of the objection, a lot of your objection seems to be that it just hasn't been worked out yet. I mean, if this was a fully funded, costed and worked out policy, are you against it both in practicality but also in concept? I'm against the compulsory side of it, in fact. Um, the government, the government, James Cleverly, the Home Secretary, said this morning there will be no criminal sanction if people don't want to do it. So it doesn't sound very compulsory to me. Well, it's said to be compulsory. Yes, but, but but again, this is another contradiction in terms. It's it's meant to be compulsory, but there won't be any criminal sanction. So what sanction will there be? I mean, it hasn't been thought through. And, for example, in Northern Ireland, I think where one of your uh, callers raising it there's never been compulsory military service in northern ireland it anyway. wouldn't work very well there i don't think uh, uh, their, right. their relationship with the uk army is is uh, not always the most positive no but but but, but also this is a this is a, a government who over the last 12 years have run down the military by 28 percent you have to look at this through the prism of a general election gimmick aimed at getting front page stories, which it did do achieve in the pro-Tory papers this morning. But when you when you look at it, it's then going to be a royal commission to examine it. And it wouldn't co- be fully enacted, a co- a co- even according to the government, uh, for, for four or even five years. This isn't a government that won't be in power in four or five years' time, or even our, by July the 5th. The, the, this, this, is, this is a nonsense. It's... The, 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 and the point is as go, well. It's going to cost two and a half billion pounds, of which one and a half billion will be will be re- redirected from another gimmick that hasn't really worked, which, which was leveling up, which is still more. Well, I, I, I actually, than I actually think it could, a policy. I actually think Paul, it's going to cost a lot more than two point five billion by the time you pay all those people. Uh, another texture says most aspiring medical students join St John's Ambulance or get part-time jobs or voluntary roles with care homes and charities working with elderly or disabled people. They generally do this to enhance applications, and um, I mean that is certainly on the on the more uh, sort of NHS side, or uh, that point is 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 germane to but certainly on the military side Simon there is this sense from Tobias Elwood who I spoke to earlier and and I'm I'm not expecting you to speak for him of course but he was saying that look the threat to this country is a big one and actually having people involved in some sort of taste of military life even if it's only for a year and it wouldn't be everybody would be something that may enhance our underfunded under-resourced 
uh, services uh, in the, the Army, the RAF and uh, the Navy and the Marines. No, I think that's right. I mean, and because it, quite rightly, and this goes back to the conversation that was initiated by um, the Chief of General Staff, General Sir Patrick Sanders, earlier on, you know, when we look at how our wars are won, they're not generally won by the volunteer regular force who are there. It's always by the volunteers, it's always by the reservists, it's always by the people who are, who are brought on before. And you need to have some sort of resilience, you need some sort of depth to it. We currently don't have that. Um, Paul is completely correct that we have also a problem, if you like, with the volunteer force in terms of its numbers, its pay, its conditions, and the resources it's got, got available to it. But this is, this is basically starting to build a sort of second line, a third line, to give us the resilience and depth to deal with what could turn out to be a kind of sustained conflict, you know, or enduring, enduring sort of confrontation with people like Russia, with China and everything that goes there. So I think it's, it's there. If I make one comment back to you, which is I thought, I thought the, your, 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 the person, Mary, I think, was from, from County Down, who emphasised the positive aspects of this. And I think that really is important too. I can think back to my own uncles who, who did national service, you know, who built very successful business careers on the training and experience and the skills they were given during their national service so i think if we organize this in such a way and says this is you building for the future not just the future of this country but your own personal future and i think it becomes a very positive thing that people wanted to join i did note i did some research prior to coming on on there that in sweden where they have a sort of a, a, a compulsory national draft and then a number of people are, are actually selected they have absolutely no problem in filling those volunteer vacancies and i think if it's packaged in such a way and said this will enhance your career this will give you additional points trying to get yourself into university uh, it could give you discounts and you know we can make this a very positive thing for the people of this country and we have less emphasis on the kind of more negative aspects about this whether it's compulsory mandatory and everything go with that okay. and all about building this country for the future and giving our young people a sense of engagement, participation, and staking that in that country. I think it's very positive. Okay, Paul, final thought from you. Um, in terms of uh, politics, do you think this will just go away or do you think this will be a major thing that will be discussed right throughout the election campaign? It's, in the short term, it's a burning issue, good for headlines, good for, good for debates on TV and radio. Um, but it, it's, un, it's unworkable. And uh, as far as the two, uh, the Lib Dems came up with a suggestion this morning, which made sense to me. If you spent the two and a half billion, but you'll need more than that to actually encourage people to actually join the full time military, it would it would be a greater benefit, you know, to our national security because de defence is a serious, serious issue. But also, there are a lot of other things that haven't been considered here. If you're going to start putting eighteen year olds into paramedic duty or the NHS. Sorry, I'm just or losing the you. I just lost your line there, Paul. If you're Sorry. going to start putting 18 year olds into. In, in, into working with the fire service, which was one thing cleverly mentioned, or the, you know, or. We're just losing the line from Paul there, unfortunately, but um, no doubt we will have, on the, have him on the programme again. Uh, thank you to Paul Connu, former Mirror Group editor and author there, and Simon Diggins, uh, defence analyst and uh, a military veteran of uh, great uh, reputation as well.